start my speech in three, two, one. Four things in my speech. Uh, first, set up. And secondly, why government did, does this well. And thirdly, why it's so beneficial. And fourthly, why it's justified. So first, set up. I think that the government will get the initial information or like maybe government require notification to banks, for example, when the major like economic events happens. And I think that this is very feasible because first, like the com uh, government oftentimes uh, have the, its own media, for example, which basically publish the economic information regularly. But second thing is that we already do these kind of similar things, like companies need to send information to competition authorities or banks have to notify the major like the, you know, when they are, you know, insolvent, for example, which means that the, this is very feasible. But I don't think that the feasibility is a big issue in this debate still uh, because this is the you know, value judgment motion. So first of all, why the government does this well? So there are two analysts here. First about incentive and second about capacity or detailed policy. So first incentive. I think that government has a huge amount of incentive to care about economic stability for three reasons. First is that the people lose trust the government if basically the government fails to like sustain the economic stability, basically affects to people like politicians' electability, which are basically the biggest or one of the biggest interests of those politicians. But second thing is that the, actually those economic instability affects tax revenue of those governments, right? Because like and also people need more like the governmental support when the economic like the uh, uh, economic like the events happens and it causes structural unemployment of those workers as well right which means that the people cannot like you know drive back the economy after those like economic uh, events happen and also like other like big, uh, governmentally owned like re uh, organizations like reserve bank like governmental institutions are also threatened because of the lack of those tax revenues and also the economic impact but third reason here is that actually bailing out or other measures to those economic crises is actually uh, expensive and also unpopular, which means that they surely have the incentive to do good uh, by do censoring like such information. But second analysis here that is not the more about capacity or what they specifically do. What this uh, censorship look like? First, we think that it's short term. For example, dealing news information which talk about such like the economic uh, events uh, for a day or something, uh, which is very uh, eff effective. Why? Because you want to like report the solution at the same time uh, when you like report about the economic like the uh, crisis happens. For example, like the now Silicon Valley Bank like event uh, crisis in two weeks ago, for example, but government can say that, the, yeah, we can actually support like the people who lose money from those economic crises at the same time when they report that the actually Silicon uh, Valley Bank is at danger and they are going uh, uh, malfunctioned. Why it's short term? Because first, people realize if it's going to the long term, which means that the risk of leaking information is bigger uh, when they uh, actually, they are more, you know, postponing its report, uh, which means that the people will go panic more, and which the government doesn't really want. Which means that the government is likely to do with a very short term and just coming up the solution and do this policy. But the second characteristic here is that I think the context of this debate is particularly country in free press. For example, China can often like falsify economic data, for example, or other countries who have like such authority can do anything, uh, anything else to control the market itself, which means that we think the delta happening in this debate is basically the country in free press or basically who cherish these values. So having said that, we already proved why it's likely to be done well with the short-term policies. So why it's beneficial? Uh, thirdly, we think uh, it's a confidence issue, right? Because like when the like economic events or were reported, like high frequency traders, like individual retail investors are basically going panic and they sell individual like holding stocks when the stock price basically increases. And also we think that the institutions such as banks are very sensitive towards such economic events and they will try to like the, you know respond to it as much as fast as possible. Why? Because like going insolvent is the very risk, like risk for those 
our banks, right? Because the price or value of the assets that those banks have will significantly decrease, which unable, which makes it unable for those com uh, like you know banks to pay back the debt that they have, which basically is a big problem for them. That's why they want to like the uh, change their uh, assets to the cash or other values. Such, uh, therefore, we prove that the, how the value of stock significantly decreases uh, with the quite small causes in the society. And the problem here is that the people don't know what the government does after these kind of events, right? That's why that the people don't know like the, if they will be supported after these economic crises. That's why they want to minimize the you know loss from the economic crisis, and they try to uh, act uh, faster and faster. The impact here is that first, people lose money, of course, because the banks are going to malfunctioning. The second thing is that the people also lose jobs because of the number of businesses who can lend from the money from banks, for example, decreases, and there's the unemployment caused by the economic uh, crisis, which means that it's more beneficial for government, for example, to drive the economy back because there are no people who basically run these kind of businesses. But third important impact here is that the increasing monopoly of banks or other organizations. Because big banks uh, can buy small banks in those such economic prices, for example, Credit Suisse, and what happens is that A, they use political power because they are too big to fail, basically. They push against regulations, for example, which basically make the economy more riskier or vulnerable to such economic crisis. And also, bank owners are very short-sighted. They want to create a much benefit a year, for example, which means that, that they are driven and uh, they're trying to uh, multiply these kind of uh, markets. And the second uh, impact here is that the, there are less competition among banks, which means that the banks doesn't really have the incentive to decrease the interest rate, for example, which means that the conditions that the people or businesses can get will be much, much worse on their side of the cost because of the monopoly of those banks. So for all those reasons, on the, uh, on the AB, by government, like the proposing the solution at the same time to the economic crisis, they can actually the stop people going from panicking and they will not sell their assets, for example, which means that the, those like the crisis will not happen and also the banks uh, monopoly could be uh, prevented. Why justify lastly? First, it's a sensitive change and now we do the similar things, right? For example, inflation like the rate is reported quarterly or unemployment rate is reported quarterly. We think that this one day delay, for example, is totally justified. But the second thing is that it prevents banks bad or, or worse action, right? Oftentimes, big banks leak information of other banks to buy others at a cheap price. We think that censorship can actually prevent these kind of uh, bad actions of big banks and we will mitigate the economy as well. And that's why we're very proud of this. Stand behind something that is simply obscene, something that this motion does not ask us to stand behind and pushes a burden onto us that simply ignores the reality of this debate. And that's because of what we explained at first, which is to say we have to defend giving governments the ability to do this, and then the governments will use it as they wish. Obviously, governments are not going to impose media blackouts. Obviously, that is detrimental for them and for the economy, as this team explains, which governments have no incentive to engage in for all the reasons we have already provided at first about why governments want good economic conditions. I will rehash them in my speech, but this team like, needs to engage with where this debate occurs. Three things in the speech. Firstly, on what this is about and why literally all of that first negative speech is void. Secondly, on leaks. Uh, and I guess I'll incorporate the principle into that, even though I think the principle, again, just misses the debate and so cannot be engaged with. And then I'll just whip all of the benefits we bring you, all of the ways in which we think that these media blackouts, or not media blackouts, this censorship in the way that it will occur is just incredibly important for individuals, for economy. Again, all of our first speech, which receives no mechanistic response at first negative about the ways that we benefit people. Okay, what is this debate about? Because here, we literally hear from first negative that this looks up having to su suppress all like economic information in a country, like maybe only for a day, maybe for a week, they say. This is just ridiculous. And that is because, as I say in my introduction, read the motion, it says we should support
support governments being able to do this, and we give you a first, why governments are not going to do this in a dumb way. That is because governments, and I think we give six reasons at first, I'm gonna, you know, rehash the most important ones. Governments desperately want to avoid financial crises, but also just like governments probably don't want to be perceived as super authoritarian, so don't want to have these blackouts, which I agree probably do seem like incredibly visible if they occur in the way that this negative team conceives them to. But we tell you, financial crises are awful, they're politically awful, governments regularly lose elections on these kind of things in time, you know, of crisis, people blame them on the government in power, they're likely to vote against them to kick them out to vote for their opposition. But additionally, we tell you that it cuts down these government's institutions. It means that they receive, you know, less tax money. More people are reliant on things like welfare, so they have less ability to engage in other policies they want to. We tell you that it creates things like structural unemployment that leave long-term issues that these governments then have to deal with into the future that again look badly on them and mean that they have a bad legacy. It means that economic institutions, reserve banks are weakened. It means that they have to do more bailouts, they have to do more stimulus packages. For literally all of those reasons and the fact that governments don't want to look authoritarian, they are not going to engage in media blackouts that is simply not what this debate is about. And I think that this means that this negative team honestly probably has already potentially lost the debate, but has to engage with it on our grounds and explain why the things that we describe at first, which looks like governments delaying information that a bank has gone under, delaying information that, you know, like stock prices are plummeting or something like that, until they have a response to go with it, until they can release it in a way that means consumers are confident, is a negative, and they don't do an inch of that at first negative. Then they tell us that this, that this is incredibly high fiat, so they can have regulations. I don't think this is high fiat, this is giving governments the ability to do something. I don't know where that fiat exists, but again, I think they're probably drawing upon a different pool to do things, you know, like give governments massive amounts of regulation or like the ability to bail out banks and that kind of stuff. I think it's a very, very different thing, even if this is high fiat in the sense that it's unpopular with populations. I don't understand why they have like more money and stuff like that to do these kind of policies. I don't think they can win on regulation either. I think, again, we explained in Techie's speech why we are likely to get more regulation because banks are less likely to be like monopolized to have that sort of lobbying power and that kind of thing that means that they are more likely to be able to get the ability to do risky things and to have poor regulation. Okay, that's why I think the debate, the debate occurs uh, where we say, and let me rehash what all the benefits of censoring in the situations that this debate is about. And I think that we give you quite a few at first. We tell you that this looks like people selling uh, like their shares, selling their stocks and stuff, and also like uh, like high frequency traders automatically selling them when the markets um, like start to dip. And this means that they just lose massive amounts of money, whereas if they had stuck with it, they would have been fine. And this is because, again, as we explained at first, individuals, and they can see it as well, individuals are probably somewhat irrational are probably not completely up to date on how all of these things work, and this means that they just lose out on massive amounts of money. But additionally, and I think we explained this as well at first, this deters people from being able to invest when the constant me or from like desiring to invest, when the constant media landscape is one about how these things are crashing, about how they're doing really badly. I think when we are able to present a like a, a narrative alongside that about how governments protect people from this, about the kind of policies that they implement to save people, the way that they bail out banks, the way that they you know make sure people don't lose on their savings, that those things become a lot better. But additionally, we just put you a lot of content on banks, on this on how this means that banks don't are forced to sell like th their stock portfolios into things like gold and cash to stop going insolvent. But also how when they do go insolvent, they are less likely to be snatched up by bigger banks. This means that less monopolies form. This means that you know like all the pulsing stuff. Literally, look to our first affirmative speech that doesn't receive uh, any like like response. I think that that means, and the fact that we explain that we avoid that really like. Uh, easily when we present a cohesive narrative means that we win this debate on impacts because we present some pretty massive impacts for literally delaying this information for a couple days, a day, so the government can figure out a response to it. I think that uh, is fantastic. Let's talk about leaks because this is where they're like, oh, if there is a singular leak, this team must lose the debate. Firstly, uh, and they give a bunch of reasons why leaks are likely to happen, internet, external actors, all of that. I think the first thing to say is that, again, the situation in which this debate occurs is one in which leaks are unlikely to happen. That is to say, when it is short periods of time and very specific information, governments are much likely to be able to have more control over something like that. Just make sure that people aren't leaking the fact that a particular bank has gone under or something like that. But additionally, I think everyone in this debate's incentive is lined up to keep this information quiet until the government has a good response. And that's to say, A, we probably criminalise leaking this information or make it, you know, something that is... I, I reckon it's probably criminal, right? Like, there's probably a massive deterrent not to do it in that sense. But additionally, financial institutions probably don't want to be publicising that they've gone under or that the financial sector is crumbling. Obviously, that is really bad for them. People, you know, withdraw their money, bank runs occur, that kind of stuff. I think their incentive is not to leak it, but instead to go with the government. As, again, we explain what people often do when it comes to merger negotiations and stuff, where it has to go through the government first before it is released to the public, and that is beneficial. A, that doesn't leak, like, 
like that doesn't that, like leaks don't happen in that sense because of all the reasons I just give, but also because it is beneficial for those companies because they don't then find out like like I guess after the fact that it's like a bad thing. But additionally, I just don't think we lose the debate on leaks because if leaks happen, I think this debate is just symmetric. That's for a couple of reasons. Firstly, if leaks do happen, I think they happen later in our world. That is to say, you know, maybe uh, like it's leaked six hours after the bank collapse, whereas in their world it happens on minute one, and that means we have six hours for governments to come up with responses and come up with the messaging and the analysis they're going to put around this to prevent things like confidence crises that this debate is about. That means that if leaks occur, they occur later, and it's still a benefit, our benefits still occur. But additionally, if it does occur from minute one, again, it is just symmetric, it's unclear what the harm is, people have the same information, this confidence stuff is still, like, like I, don't, I don't see how that is different there. I don't think that that can lose us the debate by any means. I guess on the principle, here they're just like, oh, this is authoritarian, it is unjust and unfair. I think I explain why it isn't. I think at Techie we explain that this happens in other instances. I think the merger one I have just given is probably a good thing. But that this is justified in the same way that we give our governments the ability to make sensible financial decisions all the time, that we give them a lot of power over stuff like that, in instances where we recognise that it is going to be critical. We point again to things like unemployment and inflation indicators, which are released quarterly despite the fact that they could be released, I don't know, like, potentially daily, potentially weekly, or whatever, and the fact that we allow governments to keep those hidden, we allow governments not to release those every day, because we recognise that there is a utilitarian benefit to not allowing everyone to, 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 to see those every day. I would suggest that, again, this is very much similar. This is a justifiable use of government power, and given the fact that we bring you several benefits of what it is, given the fact that they don't engage with the debate that is occurring, but instead want to act as though the Australian government is suddenly going to incur a mass media blackout, and like that's going to be a good move for some reason, I think we take it seriously. To ask in this debate is this is policy at all necessary? Because if there are other tools that already exist that banks and governments could just use to solve confidence crises, you probably should not give the government a very powerful tool to censor information that could very easily be abused and that denies people access to information they ought have the right to do. We explained to you at first negative that confidence crises can be solved in a number of ways with existing tools and that this would be a far better solution. That is to say, confidence crisis is when people suspect, for example, that a bank might have lost a lot of money and therefore go and withdraw their money too, or also pile on, and that turns into causing the bank to collapse. Here are a number of ways you could solve that. Firstly, central banks have the capacity to just loan money to banks to tide them over. That could allow them to, to assure investors and insure depositors that they are in fact good for the money. Secondly, governments frequently just take over banks when there is a confidence crisis. This literally happened to Signature Bank in New York last week. It's a very easy way to give people confidence because the idea that the government collapse is very unlikely. So if the government is backing the bank, that gives you a lot of confidence. Thirdly, there are insurance schemes that exist to help those banks, such as federal deposit insurance, which you could just increase in this particular instance. We could provide some sort of guarantee that would assure deposit holders there's no need to take their money out. Fourthly, you could provide a bailout or even just promise that you would provide a bailout if the bank fails. And notably, since this is a confidence game, you often don't even need to provide the bailout because just saying that if anything goes wrong, the bailout will be there is enough to convince people they don't need to pull their money out and investors, they don't need to worry. And finally, you could just do things like change the interest rates as necessary or engage in buying and selling of bonds, all of which are generally used to support economic stability. So at the end of this, it's just unclear why you need this policy, and that explains why you probably ought err on the side of not giving the government a tool that is easy to abuse. The second question to ask, though, is how would this tool work? Why is it likely to be deeply ineffective? Because their answer is to say, like, well, we would just hide like one piece of information for one day, it'd be very easy to do, and no one would understand, oh, no one would know that it's occurred. This misses the nuance of what Isaac explains to you, which is that financial information is interrelated and it all reflects each other, which means you can't just hide one piece of information because you can interpolate what that information would have said from all the other information that conflicts with it. So for example, when a bank loses a bunch of money and suddenly might have a confidence crisis, that will cause secured borrowers of that bank who have access to the bank's books and know that the money is missing to, for example, want to sell their loans, which will, for example, affect the bond price of the bank, which will, for example, affect the share price of the bank, to, for example, be reflected in regulatory filings that they must make, for example, the capital adequacy ratio of the bank and the fact that it's now in inadequate. All of that means that it's not just like the bank is failing as a piece of info that you just keep locked in a box for a day. Like all of this information updates in real time. That's how markets work. It's called price signals. The 
the price, like that you get information from the fact that the price reflects all available information about the bank immediately. Markets are efficient. That is why markets are so effective. So hiding this didn't just mean like, don't tell anyone the bank is failing. They'd already know from all the prices that indicate that it's failing, from all the activity of insiders selling that, if that stuff immediately. What you need to do is, for example, find a way to stop the bonds trading, find a way to stop the share price from changing, find a way to prevent anyone from selling or trading those shares at all, which is exactly why the cover-up would have to be so sophisticated. You need to do like things like freeze trading in that particular stock. You need to do things like swear large numbers of executives who have access to that financial information to secrecy, which explains why this would be incredibly difficult to do and why it would be ineffective. Because it's now a very complex conspiracy. You're getting things like stock exchanges involved and telling them that they need to either lie about the prices of bonds and shares or that they need to freeze trading and make up some excuse for doing those kinds of things. Which means it's incredibly easy for one single person to leak the fact that there's a problem at the bank and that's why all this very suspicious stuff is happening with all of the bank's tradable goods. And secondly, we explain that like the internet exists. It makes it incredibly easy to engage in those leaks. But thirdly, like don't you think other governments who spy on each other would notice that this bank has failed, would probably maybe be an investor in that bank, might own bonds in that bank, would immediately blow that up? Because of course if you're China, you would love to prove that a US bank is failing. Of course if the US, you'd like to do the same to China. It's an easy way you could exploit the other government. And it's even better if you can prove not just that their financial system is unstable, but also that the government is trying to cover it up. That it's an act of government malfeasance. That would be an incredibly powerful thing to be able to do to exactly why this is likely to be leaked. But the last thing to say is just that even if no one leaks it, it's very easy to work out occurred because you just notice that the regulatory filings haven't appeared when they should have. You just notice that the quarterly earnings report hasn't been put out when it otherwise would have. You just notice that the stocks and bonds aren't trading for some reason. There's a very suspicious freeze on it, which is exactly why at least some investors would immediately come to the opinion that something is wrong. And all it takes is sophisticated investors to understand what is happening to immediately begin the fire cell that destroys that asset, which is far worse than what would happen on side affirmative side. Look at the comparative here. On our side, we just engage in normal macroeconomic policy to stabilize the bank. On their side, they pretend everything's fine and lie to the public, freeze a number of different parts of the market, and then as soon as everyone discovers it, the benefits stop occurring because everyone works out the bank has troubles, but it's worse now because now people wonder how much information is also being faked. They wonder if maybe other banks are suspicious. They wonder if maybe the whole market is fucked up and that the government is lying about everything. So that's how you get financial contagion because immediately the damage spreads to all other parts of the economy. People become suspicious. So people want to pull their money out of the market, and put it into gold, and put it under their bed because they don't trust those markets anymore because the government has lied to them about exactly what is going on there, which is exactly why it's so devastating financial markets. But lastly, we just say there'd be massive backlash against the government writ large. Think about how bad Occupy Wall Street was because people thought that the GFC was the bankers getting one up over them. This is literally the government collaborating with the bankers to get one up over them, to deny them access to information. And they say, yeah, but people know the government has their best interests at heart and knows better than them is doing for their own good. Do people think that? Do people think that the government looks the interests of the average person? Or do they think the government looks the average of the big banks and the big executives who lobby them and pay them? Obviously, people would look at this in the worst possible way. Way, which is exactly why they would freak out, which is exactly why there'd be mass protests, which is exactly why governments would lose confidence. Currencies in developing countries where governments did this would crash as people lost faith in those governments and investors fled those governments because they didn't believe any economic information that government provided ever again in the future. Which is exactly why this policy was economically devastating. But the next thing to point out is just that how easy this would be to exploit. If you're a sophisticated investor, you can piece together the information far faster than the average person who has to wait for the media to finally bother to report on it, because you notice that the regulatory filings aren't being made. You notice that the stock price is freezing in a suspicious way. You know which banks are likely to be vulnerable to bank runs in the first place, and therefore why it might be the case that the suspicious activity is happening. And you now go out and immediately sell your assets into the market before the average person knows anything is wrong. So you get out making tons of money on those troubled assets, and some poor schmuck is stuck owning them, and they don't even prove that the thing actually fixes the underlying problem in the bank to begin with, so it might still collapse, and in that case, the average stock is fucked on their side, and they do nothing to help those people in that particular instance. But also, like, you know, people can just, like, these are sophisticated banks that could, for example, lobby the government to, when they get bad quarterly results, just help them cover that up. They could claim this is systemically important. If you don't cover it up, something bad might happen to the financial crisis. So now you just give the government a tool which can use to help its corporate cronies, and they say, well, the government won't abuse it. Why won't it? The government always obeys the interests of lobbyists. Governments are incredibly corrupt. Governments always look at the interests of the rich over the interests of the average citizen. They give you no reason as to why this would be used in the very sensible way that they tell you. The only response to all this is just to suggest, well, no, obviously 
should we keep other things secret, like mergers? No, mergers are announced publicly first. The thing that's kept secret is whether it'll be approved or not, which is a regulatory decision that is oh, like one or two people are privy to. Jordan should know this, she works at the ACCC. And secondly, they say criminal penalties will solve it. No, they won't. The market doesn't care about your criminal penalties. The last, thing I, the last thing I want to look at is just the principle of why this is deeply immoral. The claim here is very simple. People have agency, they should be allowed to make decisions for themselves, the government should not step in and act in their own best interest and claim we know what's good for you and deny them access to information that could result in them losing all their fucking money. They have the right to be able to engage in the decision of what they do with their funds. This team denied them the right to be agents who took control of their own financial futures, which is why they must lose. <laughs> past, present, or future, uh, this is a, a game, and I'm just trying to win it. This doesn't actually reflect my views on whether governments should or should not censor uh, economic information, uh, and I, I strongly believe in work-based policies, and I always follow them, and I always believe in them. Please <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about that. seems really, really scary when you don't spend most of your time dealing with it nine till five, but realistically, the governments that are affected by this debate are pretty sensible ones. Realistically, they are aware of all of the arguments and could imagine all of the arguments that this negative team could formulate, and that means that, that you should not believe the kind of doom and gloom narratives that we are getting about how this will be abused or misused, or why governments would be incredibly foolish and cause more instability. It is just unrealistic. What is more realistic is that what this looks like is short-term pauses on information that the government already collects and just a requirement that an authorization must be sought before you publish, for instance, a bank reporting to the government that it has become insolvent, something that they are usually legally obligated to do under the status quo anyway. This just give government, gives governments a, time, a bit of time to assess the damage, to figure out whether one bank declaring insolvency is going to affect 10 other banks that have all lended or been lended to by that bank, to assess the scale and to formulate a good response, which allows them to authorize that information to be released realistically, probably within a week, often within 24 hours, but to make sure that it is accompanied by a clear response, the exact kind of clear response that Isaac explained very helpfully in their first affirmative speech, or in their first negative speech, would in fact allow us to stabilize this crisis and stop it before it even happens. And we give you a number of reasons at Ted Chi's speech why these crises hurt people, why they contribute to the monopolization of the financial sector, which creates mass wealth transfer from the poorest people, from ordinary consumers to monopolists who are just able to collect rent because there's no competition. That is an incredibly powerful and an incredibly justified burden in this debate. So, what do we explain? Firstly, that it's only, you know, the, the motion doesn't say that government should be able to suppress the censor the publication of all economic news during confidence crises. Presumably, we would just do something like, for instance, when we were notified of the Silicon Bank Valley, of Silicon Valley Bank insolvency, put a 24-hour hold on that being published, and make sure that we could step in immediately when that was being published and say, you're guaranteeing all investor deposits, that would head off a series of different kinds of instability or a series of other confidence crises that could have affected banks and in other circumstances very well might have affected banks. I think that if the government had had this power in 2008, was able to put a pause on the news of Lehman Brothers going under for a couple of days and just formulate the response that said, we're guaranteeing your deposits, it doesn't matter, it's okay, you're always get your money back, that would have meaningfully helped stabilize that crisis, would have stopped people from losing their money, losing their jobs, selling their assets when they shouldn't have due to irrational herd behavior that often drives both institutional investors, but in particular retail investors, but the point where they are frightened by this, sell and then realize those losses and cannot make them back, and are then turned off from investing in the future because of that incredibly negative experience. All stuff we explained to you at Ted's sheet gets no response. The final thing to suggest here is that every type of analysis that they give you on why leaks are incredibly likely is another reason to believe that this is only used in very limited circumstances like the ones that we described, that it is done very carefully in the way that we describe, and it is not done in the draconian, insane ways that they suggest governments would do for some reason that is never explained beyond, I guess, the idea that governments are kind of spooky actors who often do spooky things. So I think that at the end of it, that was not enough, and you should believe that economic regulators and governments are sensible in the way that they use their powers, and of course, you know, obviously I can point to other things like corporate capture and economic power means that presumably institutions would not allow the government to get away with the worst versions of this, would pursue them in the court system, would pursue them in other ways or in political ways that would again keep this power relatively limited and exercised in only very reasonable circumstances. 
The final thing to say here, though, is that the flow-on and contagion things that we get mostly in this speech actually are just like not that big of a deal. Like it kind of blows them out in a really strange way. But the important thing to understand here is that at the point when this power is something that is known to occur, the market would price it in. And that might cause some very minor short-term instability, but it's unlikely to be major. The second thing to understand here is that I suspect that most people would actually react to this relatively positively. Because the other actor that ordinary individuals are quite frightened of is big institutional banks, is high-frequency traders who contribute to destabilization of, econ destabilization of economies when they get this news because they do things like have automatic programs that mean that when the value of a particular stock dips beyond value, that is instantly sold off. Often these programs are common across many large-scale institutional investors, which means that even relatively small bits of information, like a singular bank like Silicon Valley or other banks going insolvent, can trigger large scaling effects, which mean that you get huge changes in the market over a 24 to 48 hour period that are not reflective of rational information or good forms of trading, and are instead just reactions of human emotion that really hurt ordinary people who lose their savings, who sell because they're affected by that emotion, that contribute to other banks becoming insolvent because all of a sudden the value of their asset pool tanks, but their liabilities stay the same. That means that those banks go under and they again get bought out cheaply or just exit the market, which contributes to worse forms of consolidation, worse forms of financial behavior, higher risk behavior that all hurts ordinary individuals and means that it is much harder to regulate the sector, much harder to keep it under control because of these silly, irrational, bad things that occur that should not be allowed to occur and could be easily stopped by an incredibly sensible, uh, an incredibly sensible use of this power in, again, relatively limited but quite high impact circumstances. All of that is good. The last thing that we are left with then is the idea that, oh, banks will like dump their bonds on people while knowing they're insolvent. Guys, trading while insolvent is a crime. It's not allowed and it's pretty well policed. The second thing to understand here is that this doesn't really make sense because banks like stocks or bonds or whatever are not usually, like they're not issued daily by banks. Like often an issuing of those things is relatively rare. Jeez, nobody would notice that a bank didn't issue one on one particular day because they often only issue them in, lim in relatively limited tranches occasionally. And of course, like, you know, most bonds and stocks and other assets are traded kind of on the second hand market, like the stock market and stuff like that. They're not being newly issued by banks or newly created such that a failure to create them would spook people. Let's then finally talk lastly about principles and justification. The first thing to understand here is that this is incredibly in line with things governments do already. And that is to say, we don't do things like flood the market with day by day updates on unemployment or day by day updates on inflation, even though we probably could, could because we recognize that that is one, silly, but two, also probably would distort markets and contribute to irrationality in ways that were bad. Second thing is that we allow businesses to protect their information, and in that case to, I guess, censor news by using things like business secrets or trade secrets. That's all something we accept as being fine in the economy. For instance, businesses are required to notify governments when they enter into merger talks often, especially when those businesses are large and the mergers would move the market. But that is information that is kept confidential and we think that that is fine, like we accept that that is fine because of the fact that again, those early stage talks are things governments should know about, but we accept markets probably should not because they would affect the market in biased and bad ways that would often hurt people and contribute to instability and irrationality. And that is also obviously done pretty well and is pretty accepted. The last thing to say here is that we have the absolute capacity to do this because often the information that we would want to censor here is information that institutions we explain to you in Gypsy and Tetsu speech would want to keep private, do already have to notify the government about, and the government would just sit on that information and would not publish it in the way that it often does now or allows banks or other actors to publish now. It's feasible, it's reasonable, and it's justified. This is a sensible way of making sure that markets are more rational, they are more effective at serving the people and the, co and the country that obviously facilitate those markets existing in the first place, that place their trust in those markets, that place their money in those markets. That is all completely fine. This is some news being temporarily delayed from making it onto the market so that governments have the chance to react and to form a sensible policy response that reassures investors and reassures institutions and ordinary people that they are not about to lose their money. This is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. It is not comparable to the types of rhetoric and the types of material that this negative team stands behind, and it does meaningfully promote a better, more competitive marketplace, better outcomes for ordinary consumers, and safer ones that make people feel safer when they invest their savings. Proud to affirm.
the response from governments on affirmatives world is that we will promise people that when a bank collapses, uh, they will, people, investors will not lose their money. Why the fuck don't we just do that on our side? The problem with this affirmative team is really simple. They claim that governments are reasonable, they claim that governments will use this policy well, but they never explain how it actually makes you better off at being able to solve this crisis, aside from, quote, uh, you have an extra day to think of a response. When the only responses they give, the only responses they explain, are all examples we give in Uday's speech, are all things that they never explain why you actually need that additional time and that additional information in order to achieve. So even at the point where this is a capacity and there's a potential thing you could use, they never even explain the imperative as to why this is something you use. Don't listen to gaslighting, don't listen to lies, we do give responses to their case, then claiming that they are reasonable is not sufficient for them to win the debate. Three questions then in the speech. Firstly, is this a just policy? Secondly, are governments likely to censor properly if we assume it works? And finally, is this actually going to work and fix consumer confidence? Firstly, on a just policy. Jordan claims at first, ah, this only occurs some of the time to like prevent instability. One, completely unclear as to A, whether or not this is actually likely to be unstable, or B, what the incentives are for governments to actually use this sparing to use it well. Because literally the only incentives are governments care about economic stability. Obviously governments care about economic stability in the status quo. Notably, that doesn't mean that uh, government economic stability is insured, which means that at any point there is any slight practical failure in their case, uh, it's not sufficient to just assume because governments care about their economies, they are always going to use this in a way that's just. Governments often obviously can make economic mistakes. That's why the GFC happens. That's why literally every economic crisis has happened, and they've gotten worse at the point where governments are able to respond insufficiently. I think America's COVID response is probably an excellent example of that, and certainly China's as well. Second claim they make here is, ah, this is in line with the existing government policy, and so it's likely to be fine. Notably though, the examples they give are like, oh, well, we don't release interest rates daily. Yes, but there is the information where if you wanted to, you could count daily change in inflation and be able to identify that. And that would suggest as well this team would support like banning, finding out inflation every day, providing very limited justification as to why that's actually the case. Like presumably if someone does want to publish an interest rate daily, that's like fine. Like they never explain why that is actually like the particular problem. Meanwhile, what do we tell you on our side about whether or not this is just policy? We explain, A, censorship is just bad. Their claim of Jordan is literally, quote, people would react positively to this. No, people do not react positively at when you ban them from seeing information that is actively about their finances, actively about the things they care about. When it was the companies that they had money in that was crucial to things like their superannuation, was crucial to things like whether or not they would be able to actually continue to afford and pay bills in the future, or as we to literally in millions of dollars that high profile investors had any stocks, you absolutely did care at the point any information you had that could mean you were making a bad decision at any one time and taken from you, that obviously was something you cared about. <laughs> Secondly, we explained that primarily this is going to affect the least sophisticated investors. That's what's saying they're the ones who are least likely to have alternative avenues to find out and notice gray spots in the market where this is clearly abnormal. And as such, at the point a bank, for example, collapses and you do not know, those long, most vulnerable people who have the least are like who have the most hinged pretty much on these investments and who have like the most hopes for them are the ones who are most likely to suffer this. Finally, we explain there's just a huge capacity for this to be abused. The literal only response to this is like, ah, oh, well, governments wouldn't let banks do this. Uh, why not? There is literally no reason given in this affirmative team's bench about why banks wouldn't just any time if things are looking a bit grim, lobby the government to shut off information and just trade at high prices. Because their claim here is literally, ah, oh, banks are insolvent, they can't trade and sell stock. Yes, but obviously there's the point before they hit insolvency where they can just trade at that stock price. Completely unexplained. I think it's sufficient to explain this is completely unjust policy, no imperative on their side as to why this is meaningful on principle grounds. For that reason, I think we take that. Secondly, assuming this works, are governments likely to censor properly? There are kind of two claims they make here. First, governments are censored to do it well, which I've already responded to as to why it's not necessarily the case. But let's look at their claims on capacity and why they claim that this is likely to be particularly good. They say, ah, oh, this is delayed information, not media blackouts. Okay, this is just insane. Because as we explained to you down the bench at first and second, economies are integrated, individual parts of economies affect every other thing that's out of that falls out of that, right? That is to say, Berman have never explained how you stop shares from taking, how you stop bondholders selling out, how you explain lenders sounding the alarm and point things want to be, uh, to be kept private. The claim is like, ah, oh, this only affects secondary markets. I mean, yes, like maybe. However, obviously secondary markets are directly related to actual economic markets. And so the point that those economic markets do things like stock information, the point banks, for example, stop engaging in sharing and selling and trading, uh, the second-hand market does realize that we do see consequences. So necessarily, if you actually believe on their side that this has to work, you need huge amounts of political capital, huge amounts of money in order to actually make sure this is censored properly. And the point of weighing I would note here is this is just extraordinarily resource intensive at that point, right? Because you're spending money and you're spending energy and time into covering up this information and making sure it doesn't spread. At which point, uh, there's no explanation 
explanation given as to why you just don't use that time for money to just do better kinds of economic reform and immediately address that problem that we suggest you can do on our side. Which means that even if you believe that this black hat is successful, which without a proof why it's not, uh, simply it just takes resources and time that is not necessary for actually solving this problem. It can just be used in getting better solutions. What other claims do we make under this? We tell you that this financial information is actually ah, already explained that. Uh, what other response they have briefly? They're like, ah, this is a short period of time, governments are likely to keep it secret. We explain, like, obviously, if the point you believe that these solutions are actually so complex, which are never explained in their case, all solutions they give are pretty simple of things, just government announcing things, for example. Uh, it's insufficient as to why, like, you would need any time, but at the point you believe they do need time, these probably quite complicated solutions while you're identifying the scope of the problem, which means this probably is likely quite a long time if you care as much as they do about actually believing this is sold well, which would suggest that it is actually up for a fairly extended period of time, not only principally and practically we've already explained why it's bad to any capacity of time. The final thing they say is, ah, the financial sector won't publish this because they will not lose money. Maybe, but they also have active incentives to profit off of this kind of thing, which would suggest that there are individual institutions who would have active incentives to profit off this. And if they didn't, simply there are other actors who would, right? These journalists, foreign countries, all of which we explain at Uday to suggest they have huge incentives in order to uncover this. Zero response from this affirmative team is how they ever would actually manage, manage or deal with any of this. I am going to explain censorship, which is notably contingent on their entire case working, is extraordinarily unlikely. Because now let's get to this final thing. Is this actually likely to solve consumer confidence? Piece of way I noted at the start here is their big shift in gypsy speech of explaining, oh, well, governments would use this very rarely, is actually quite problematic in the case. That is to say, at the point individuals know that the government has this power to be able to short term put restrictions on information, obviously confidence in the entire economic market goes down because you never know whether or not you're being liked if you're the average investor, which notably was the person who was most likely to call it things like bank runs when they had insecurity in the financial system. So, if you believe that people are just aware of this policy at all, not even if a leak is uncovered, then people are extraordinarily likely to lose safe in economies that cause all these kinds of negative effects they desperately on their side were trying to avoid in the first place, because there's just a higher level of suspicion on the economy in general, which I think is sufficient to suggest that even if you believe this might work well in some cases, at the point anyone finds out this policy is a thing governments will do, people would be likely to react extraordinarily badly. We explain in this issue on whether or not solving consumer confidence there are a series of things you can do to fix this. Loans, takeovers, insurance schemes, you can promise to bailouts, you can change interest rates, you can buy and sell. All of these mechanisms, they never explain a single mechanism on their side of solving these problems that is unique. Which will just, we just have equal capacity to solve all the problems they mentioned and they never give any mechanization to suggest otherwise. They literally have two responses to this, which is like, ah, well we need to prevent people's emotive reactions to things. One, I've just explained probably a more strong emotive reaction point in which you believe that uh, individuals do not believe that the government is telling them the truth about economies anymore, especially the most, uh, least, like, I guess the least, uh, like, knowledgeable investors. Because obviously the most knowledgeable investors, as we can, because they probably can tell whether or not the government is telling the truth or not. The problem is, those lower level investors can't, and those are the ones who are most likely to cause bad financial behaviour that actually affects all the consequences you get on their side. I think at the end of this debate, then, it is really, really simple. It is unclear in their case, whether or not this problem is something that actually needs this time barrier to be fixed. It's extraordinarily unclear whether or not you can do anything useful with that time period, particularly when all the solutions either team can use to deal with this financial crisis seems to be the same. At that point, we consider it was an unjust policy, we consider it was incredibly likely to go badly, even if it did, the fact it existed was still something that was net bad for the economy, we had to give this debate a slight <laughs>